Yeah, welcome to Good Morning, Good Day, Afternoon, Street, Street. I'm Diane, oh, Tony and Diane from Out and About for Glean TV. And today we have a special presentation by Mr. Abraham Lincoln, father of Illinois. I guess you would call that, call that. And he's got a very, very, very special presentation for us about his life and time uh, during that time. So please enjoy, and thank you all for coming to uh, Good Morning, Good Day Cafe. This episode of Out and About with Tony and Diane is sponsored by Good Morning, Good Day Cafe, 417 East Main Street in Streeter, Illinois. Carolina seceded. 
followed by like six other states. I hadn't even left Springfield yet, and by February, Jefferson Davis was sworn in as a provisional president of the Confederate States of America. Finally, um, arrived in, in D.C. I couldn't win. Um, I wrote a speech that was where I tried to lay out my position, but also to be somewhat conciliatory to the South. Um, I did not actually deliver the speech myself. I wrote it out, and it was given to somebody else to, to read. And this is another subject of debate. Nobody is quite sure whether he read it as I wrote it or whether he made emendations. At any rate, the press results were newspapers in the North were saying, oh, for heaven's sake, he pretty much just gave away the whole game to the South. Southern newspapers were saying it was a virtual declaration of war against him. This is what you get when you try to walk the middle line. I once had to send an individual off into a difficult situation. There were two rival factions at each other's throats. And I sent this guy over to deal with it. And I told him at the time, you're probably doing a better job if both sides hate you than if one side hates you and the other side likes you. I don't remember how he did. Anyway, um, my first inaugural didn't go off, off all that well. Um, and there was a situation brewing. There were a number of people, uh, like Jefferson Davis and a number of other senators, they all resigned within the few months of the uh, of the uh, election. And as the state seceded, some of the, the military installations just went straight off to the new country, to the Confederacy. But two, the garrison stayed loyal to the Union. One was Fort Pickens off of Florida, and it was so situated that the Confederates couldn't do anything about it. It was easily resupplied, easily defended, so they just left it alone. The other two were in Charleston Harbor, completely sealed off. Now, I guess at first, um, before I even became president, uh, uh, President Buchanan sent uh, Robert Anderson to take charge there. And the first thing he did was abandon one of the two forts, Fort Moultrie, and move everybody off into the Fort Sumter, which was in the middle of the harbor, and harder to get at. And it seemed like, for the most part, during the Buchanan, what was left of the Buchanan administration, General Beauregard, <coughs> head of the military works in South Carolina, allowed the garrison to come ashore and do their grocery shopping and buy food. But as the new year wore on, and and by not and my inauguration was closer. These visits were, were stopped. Buchanan sent uh, a resupply mission, and the, the the garrison in South Carolina fired on it and drove it away. So now I'm president, and this is now an issue. Finally, not wishing to recognize Jefferson Davis as president of anything, I sent a notice to Governor Pickens in South Carolina that I was sending a <coughs> supply mission to Fort Sumter. There would be no more men. There would be no more arms or ammunition, just food and clothing. 
that was the start of a war. Pickens informed Davis. Davis said, let the shooting begin, annoying Governor Pickens because he wanted to be the one to give the order. And under command of, of General Beauregard, the, the bombardment started. There's some doubt as to who fired the first shots. It may have been uh, uh, Major Chestnut, but the husband of uh, Mary Chestnut, who was a great diarist and kept. If you want to learn about what was going on in the South during the Civil War, read her diary. It's out there. It's available. Um, but there was another gentleman, Edmund Ruffin, who had also been a, uh, a United States senator and had retired, who claimed to have fired the first shot. We'll come back to him eventually. So, bombardment lasted a couple of days, and Anderson said, we have no, nothing to fire back with. We're out of food. And he surrendered. Uh, the only casualties were uh, two men killed when a gun exploded. When they were firing one last salute as the flag came down. I have to wonder, and I don't think anybody has really have really covered this. If Jeff Davis had just said, "All right." Let your supply ships come in. There wasn't a whole lot else I could do. I promised them that I wouldn't attack unless I was attacked. Uh, eventually, so I essentially tied my hands in, in that regard. They would have been allowed to continue. Eventually, European recognition would have come in, Great Britain and France being the major powers at that point. And it would have been a done deal. The South could have won the Civil War without there having ever been a war, without firing a single shot. But, and almost everybody even in the South knew that as soon as it would come to shooting, the South could not win against the material and numerical superiority of the North. But they had to do it anyway, didn't they? They just had to do it. And, and I mentioned John Quincy Adams earlier. He knew it. His diary recently came out, and there's a, a passage where he says, there's just no two ways about it. The slavery issue is going to have to be settled by war. It's going to be a terrible, bloody war, but how glorious the final result. 30 years, he was writing this 30 years before the Civil War. So, yes. I summoned up some troops and sent them into sent them into, into Virginia. Retook Alexandria, but essentially ran into one stalemate after the other. And that's almost the history right there in a nutshell of the first part of the Civil War. Um, nobody getting much anywhere. Somewhere in 1862, General McClellan, who wasn't the quickest on the draw, doing anything, actually managed to get to within 20 miles of Richmond, Virginia, the Confederate capital. But he fell into a trap set by General Lee. gave me um, the excuse. I, I had drafted preliminary emancipation 
proclamation. As a military necessity, I did not feel like I had legal authority to mess with slavery where it was legal within the United States. But these states were in rebellion, and thousands of people had been crossing into Union lines. And at first, Union officers politely handed them back to their masters. But eventually it was decided that this is enemy property. Still legally recognized as property, but enemy property, and we held them in camps as contraband. It's sometimes said that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free a single person, because obviously I was freeing the people in the South and not the people in the North would stay loyal to the Union. But it freed those people immediately. There were several thousand. And I managed to raise an army of like 150,000 men out of their number. Anyway, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't take proper effect until January 1st, 1863. I spent the night shaking hands with people on New Year's Eve. And when the morning came, I had a shaky hand. I said, I don't want to look like my hand shook while I'm signing this document. It came out pretty steadily. I was never more sure that I was doing the right thing than I was with that. So 1863 got off to a fairly good start, finally replaced McClellan with Burnside, who marched himself into another stalemate, replaced him with General Hood, no, General Hooker. There was a General Hood, but General Hooker, and who marched himself into another bloody stalemate. And Lee broke loose and headed north once again. Meanwhile, things weren't going all that badly to the west. There were some setbacks, some coming and going, but gradually driving the Confederates south, they made two attempts to take Kentucky, Kentucky State. Kentucky first declared itself neutral. But when Confederates invaded, they said, heck with that, we're staying with the north. And it took a while, but we finally drove the Confederates out of Kentucky. Same thing with Missouri. It took a while, but we drove them out of Missouri. These were two slave states, by the way, that remained loyal to the Union. And then slowly but surely sealed off the Mississippi River and the other rivers leading to the Gulf. Admiral Farragut took New Orleans, sealing off the bottom of the Mississippi River, and took more and more of the Mississippi River away from them until only one stronghold was left, the fortress at Vicksburg. And General Grant was out to get them. He tried direct assaults that didn't work. He tried tunneling underneath and blowing part of it up. That didn't work. So eventually he just sort of circled it around, sealed it off, prevented anything from getting in or out. And eventually that worked. Meanwhile, Lee once again was heading north. And Hooker was very reluctant to do anything about it. He sort of stayed between Lee and DC, but Lee was had his eyes set further north, like he was heading towards Philadelphia. He had to get rid of Hooker and replaced it with General Meade. And General Meade planted himself in Lee's path at Gettysburg. July 4th, 1863, Vicksburg fell to Grant, and Meade drove Lee back south. Let him escape again. <clears throat> but pretty much that was the turning point of the war. A couple of days later, 
A crowd gathered at the White House as news of these two victories got around. Serenaded me out of bread with a brass band and called on me to make a speech. And I said something along the lines, how long ago was it? Some 80 odd years when on the birthday of the United States of America, they declared that all men are created equal. Suddenly occurred to me that I was onto something and that I had better shut up before I wrecked it. And I wound up pretty much begging for more music from the brass band. But I wrote a poem. I once considered a career as a, as a serious poet. There's, you can find it. There's, I wrote a poem about Niagara Falls. Um, there's a poem called the Suicide Soliloquy. And all I'm going to say about, about it is, it's bad enough for me to do it. But I'm not going to admit to it otherwise. Um, but my poem on this occasion was, General Lee's invasion of the North as written by himself. In 1863, with pomp and mighty swell, me and Jeff's Confederacy set off to sack Fildell. But the Yankees, they got arter us and dug us particular hell, and so we scampered back again and never sacked Fildell. So yes, that's, uh, that's my abilities as a poet. <laughs> but eventually, of course, I got the um, invitation to say a few words at a dedication ceremony for a cemetery at the battlefield of Gettysburg. And I got right to work. Now, we'll skip ahead to November 19, 1863. The main speaker was to be Edward Everett, renowned as one of the finest orators of the day. Um, the ceremony started with a very long prayer. My secretary, John Hay, was saying, does this prayer think it's the main oration or what? <laughs> then there was some music from the brass band. And then Edward Everett stood up to speak. He had been having bladder trouble earlier in the day, so they had to set up a tent so that he could take care of things as needed. And but somehow he got through two hours of masterful oratory. Then there was a hymn. I've tried looking this up. I would love it. And I hear I have to say, I wasn't feeling well. I had a bit of a fever. I was not well on that day. And so my memories of some of it are a little hazy. And I would love to know what this hymn was. And I've managed to find out, don't ask me right now because I'm not remembering, but that I found out the guy who composed it. And I think the words are out there, but there doesn't seem to be any record or recordings or any memories of the actual music. And then it was my turn. Um, there was a photographer there that day who said, oh, it's the president's turn. I need to get another plate into my camera. By the time he got the new plate into the camera, I was done. The Gettysburg Address is pretty much about two minutes long. Went back home and found out that I was suffering from a mild case of smallpox. I was put into quarantine and I was going, oh, shucks, now I have something I can give everyone. <laughs> and reading, um, reading reviews of the Gettysburg Address. Here's one from the Chicago Times. The cheek of every American must tingle with shame as they read the silly, flat, dishwatery utterances of the President of the United States. I had a feeling people were disappointed. Well, yeah, um, very soon after, Edward Everett was asking me for a copy and as were other people, so, well, okay, maybe it wasn't so bad. 
but my next problem was, what had I said? Um, the newspaper accounts differed from, there are like a couple of copies that remain from actually before. And they're just scribbled over and crossed out and rewritten. So it's kind of hard to know what, I, what my intentions were. And I couldn't tell either at that point. And the newspaper accounts didn't quite agree. But um, finally, I think the last one I wrote out was the one that everybody knows. I am not going to recite that now. Um, but let's just move on a little bit. Um, as I said, pretty much things were on. Um, it took a while, but we were, we were in the last legs. I put Grant in charge of all the Union armies in early in 64. Um, and when he ran into a stalemate, because Lee, as in defense, he was, there was nobody like him. Offense, he tended to take chances. And I guess there was nothing else he could do. He, Either he took the chance or he didn't, or, or there was nothing to it. But he tended to lose under those circumstances. So here he was back in defense, and Grant would butt heads with him. But instead of retreating, Grant kind of sidestepped, forcing Lee to stretch a little further. Butt heads again. Another stalemate, but sidestep again and forcing Lee to stretch further. And that is pretty much the history of 1864. General Sherman was left in charge in the West and from there he made his march from West to the Atlantic Ocean which uh, was ultimately successful. He cut a pretty good swath of destruction for which he is still unfondly remembered in the South. But he, he, got, he got the point across. Finally, 18, he made it. He, yes, he took Atlanta, continued on to the sea, and presented me with the city of Savannah as a Christmas gift. 1865, there was pressure on me to actually make, to just feel out the South about peace efforts. And there was, I actually met a bunch of delegates from the South, amongst them Alexander Stevens, who was the, at that time, the Vice President of the Confederate States. Their proposal was cease hostilities join forces, and invade Mexico. Now, to be sure, there were some odd things going on in Mexico at that time. The French Emperor, Napoleon III, installed a cousin as Emperor of Mexico, and kind of dared us to do something about it. And if we hadn't been involved you know, in the Civil War, he probably would have, or he probably wouldn't even have tried. You would know better. Yeah. any rate, I wasn't going along with that. So the peace effort at Hampton Roads was a failure. Um, I had mentioned that the Emancipation Proclamation took effect January 1st, 1863. Early in 18... 65, um, the 13th Amendment was finally voted in. That would free, abolish slavery throughout the United States, whatever that might entail at that point. Um, Delaware was a slave state. I think there were like half a dozen slaves in the whole state, and they pretty much had abolished slavery. We had abolished slavery in D.C. Maryland 
gradually gave up slavery. Kentucky and Missouri. And Tennessee, which pretty much had fallen back under hard control, we started work abolishing slavery there. And Louisiana. So the work was, was well on its way, even at that point. Um, but the 13th Amendment, which finally make it official. So I didn't think I was going to get reelected in November, but somehow the miracle worked. Things improved enough so that people decided to reelect me in March. I um, was re-inaugurated. And very shortly thereafter, Richmond fell to Grant. That was pretty much the end of it. Uh, Jefferson Davis fled. And Grant finally cornered Lee at Appomattox Courthouse. And Lee surrendered. Wasn't quite over. There was still Sherman facing Joseph E. Johnston in North Carolina, I think, at this point. Um, and there was still some fighting going on in the West. But that was enough. I figured all we have to do is hear from Sherman. And as you all know, Mary and I, on the 14th of April, went to see a play. Our American cousin. Not bad, actually. <laughs> um, there's some land poor British aristocrats um, who learned to their horror that somehow the entire fortune has been inherited by an American cousin who is coming across to take charge of the estate. Um, it eventually turns out that they are under the thumb of an unscrupulous investor, and the American cousin actually straightens that out. And he also falls in love with the with the granddaughter of the guy who who left him all the money, and manages to uh, work things out so that she gets her proper inheritance. But a bunch of people get mad at him. And there's one lady who accuses him of bad matters and, and et cetera, et cetera. And he says, well, I guess I know enough to put one over on you, you old mad trap, you sock dollarizing old something or other, and this gets such a laugh that you can fire a gun off in the theater and nobody would hear it. And that's what happened. So <laughs> that's pretty much the end of my story, but it's, you know, things continue. I want you all to know that Jefferson Davis was caught not wearing his wife's dress. Okay. Um, it was like one last battle in Texas. The Union troops were repulsed. And the next day, the, the Confederate troops came out under a white flag and said, you know, we, we heard that this is kind of all over. Maybe we should all just go home. And that's pretty much what they did. Um, Edmund Ruffin, who claimed to fire the first shot of the Civil War, fired the last shot by putting a bullet into his own head because he just couldn't stand the thought of living under Yankee domination and accepting blacks as, as equals. So I think I've got to wrap things up. You know, the Gettysburg Address had its point at the time. And of course, it's still my most famous speech and one of my shortest speeches. But, uh, you know, I'm thinking about it, and some of what I had to say then is still somewhat relevant. So, 12 score and seven years ago, our forebears brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all people are created equal. Eight score years ago, we were involved in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation 
so conceived and so dedicated could long endure. We met on the great battlefield of that war to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives there that this nation might live. It was altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we could not and we cannot dedicate, consecrate, nor hallow not only that ground in Gettysburg, but sacred sites dotted all over this nation. Those who struggled there and elsewhere and everywhere had already consecrated it, consecrated it all far above our poor power to add or detract. It. it sometimes seems that the world better remembers what was said there than what was done there and what it was done for. And here we are, 160 years later. And it is rather for us, the living, to be dedicated now to that cause for which so many fought and have thus far so nobly advanced. It is for us, the living, to rededicate ourselves to the great task still remaining, that from those honored dead and those still struggling, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave and give the last full measure of devotion. That we here and now highly resolve that the struggle shall not be in vain. That this nation, under God, shall be continually reborn with liberty and justice for all. And that this government of all the people, by all the people, and for all the people, shall not perish from the earth. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. That we do all, that we strive on to do all that may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. I think I'm And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all enjoyed the program. Um, I learned a few things. I know several of us have learned a few things here today. Anyway, there we go. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Mr. Lincoln. It's been a super, super pleasure. Thank you. This is Diane for Out and About with Tony and Diane for Glean TV for Mediacom. This episode of Out and About with Tony and Diane is sponsored by Good Morning, Good Day Cafe, 417 East Main Street in Streeter, Illinois.